And now, live from Level 5 Productions on the island of Milleronia, it's The Larry Miller Show! Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and everyone who needs something for the dirty laundry. Hi, folks, and welcome back to The Larry Miller Show. I'm Larry Miller, but in a way, aren't we all? And it's beautiful today, nice and cool, too. We're back on the mainland. We're not on Milleronia right now, so Colonel Jeff and I and uh, and the doggies are here in, well, in the recording studio. And uh, as Colonel Jeff just mentioned, my uh, wife, so we're at Stately Miller Manor, my wife may be coming home soon, and I think, uh, as he pointed this out, one of the doggies, whose name is spelled capital M, small A, small G, small G, small I, small E, may just uh, get up and, well, want to get out. That's fine. She's entitled to do that, and it certainly won't make me angrier than I always am at her. (laughs) But no, I'm not really. But you know what, folks? It's good to be home. It's a gorgeous day here, and well, that's the the music always makes me feel so good, and I love saying that because it's true. That's of course the. John Witherspoon Orchestra and the Anne Margaret Dancers featuring boy tenor Don Riley asking the musical question, My hamper just died. Should it have a burial at sea? Good question. And both the colonel and I said, Hmm, good one, Don. Now, this is in a way a two-part answer. First of all, no. No, it doesn't deserve a burial at sea. Land hampers don't care for the sea. That's just the the truth. That's the bottom line. But here's an interesting uh, addition to that. If the hamper had been at sea already, had been on a warship serving and, uh, well, and really saw a lot of years of service there, and if they got a new one on board ship, well, yes, you know, by the way, that hamper could suddenly be very useful for other things on a, on board a ship, uh, like garbage. They could take it down to the mess hall and cookie could see to it that all the things that, that he didn't need. Well, a lot of fish heads and a lot of this chopped up and this and that. And, uh, you know, a little, a little, a little smelly, a little, a little ucky, but it could be very useful for that because then once it gets full, well, one of the sailors could uh, just carry it upstairs and over to the side of the ship there and dump it. Just, you know, not in front of everyone. They don't have to do that. You don't want to walk up to the ca- where the captain and his officers are plotting something there. We're seeing where the stars are. But, you know, you go back, you know, to the, uh, to the, what, not, the bow of the ship and, well, and dump it there. And then after, you know, after that, after, well, after a lot of uh, use in garbage there, they could use it in after a battle for body parts. And, uh, you know, let's be honest, that's, you know, the, the, you need something for that. And parts of the, well, hands, feet, and things like that. And uh, you know what? And I, I just want to say, and this is where the answer has a second part, really. Because after that, after a lot of, after years of garbage duty, and after years of body part dumping as well, you know what? That old hamper might just deserve a burial at sea. And it might be just oh, worn out enough and torn enough and, and well, stained enough. And uh, they should have, at that point, the whole crew turned out for a regular warship burial the way the Brits used to do it. And they have that drum roll. And they put the hamper on a big board, you know, a big piece of plywood. Oh, big, too. It's about six feet wide and about ten feet long. And you put the hamper on it, cover it with a British flag, and then tip it over to the side. And the thing slides out. 
And there will be a lot of good memories for that hamper, by the way, because for one thing, that flag is going to smell something awful. But you know what? Good question, Don. My hamper just died. Should it have a burial at sea? No, technically, but if you can find a way or if you want to contribute for a hamper for one of our warships, ultimately, after a lot of good service, it will deserve a burial at sea. And speaking of burial, by the way, this is, I mentioned John Witherspoon there as the orchestra leader. John just passed away. And we were friends and uh, never hardly saw each other, but uh, knew each other from the days when we were oh, in the comedy store and the improv and those places. And uh, he was always terrific. He was always uh, very gracious and uh, nice to run into. And he just died. Uh, so, you know what? It's worth saying. Good luck, John. God bless you. And uh, you were always, uh, well a good comic and a good actor and and funny and and kind. So, you know what? We'll uh we'll send you over the side too there and uh, you deserve a flag on it yourself. And by PayPal. That's right, PayPal, a terrific group. Well, these these guys are terrific. If you enjoy the show here, and why wouldn't you? And you'd like to send us a few bucks to help out. And why wouldn't you? You can do it through PayPal. And what I always like is instead of saying to you, know, donate this or pay what you like, I always like to say, buy us some drinks. Let's leave it at that because there are different levels for drinking. Level one through five, all the way up to, we're driving to Florida! <laughs> Boy, that sounds like the ovation... After you toss that hamper over the side of the ship. And uh, you know what, though? It's, it's a terrific group. Look for the PayPal banner on our website, LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. Oh, excuse me. I shouldn't have had the herring. But you know what, folks? Every little bit you send helps us keep the old leg lamp lit. And thank you to everyone who's contributed already and may just do that right now. And that brings me to my favorite part of the show, the joke of the week. A guy and his wife are driving down the freeway and get pulled over by a cop. And they, you know, the cop was, you know, walks up to the window there and the guy says, what's, what's going on here, officer? I don't, I was, why did you pull me over here? And the uh, the cop says, well, you were speeding. Uh, you're going at least 75 there. And uh, this is, you know, this is not a zone for that. And the guy just jumps and says, yeah, wait, wait, wait a minute. I, no, I, I, I wasn't. I wasn't going 75. I was going 55, 60 tops. But and then his wife suddenly says, oh, Harry, please, you were speeding. You're doing at least 80. And uh, the cop then says to him, uh, oh, and by the way, number two, I'm giving you another ticket for your broken taillight. And the guy said, what are we talking about, broken taillight? I didn't, I, I, first of all, I didn't know I had a broken taillight. And I, I, I don't think I should be cited for that, too. And his wife leans over and says again, Harry, stop it. You knew that taillight was broken weeks ago. In fact, you said it to me. Oh, that stupid taillight. Now I'll have to get another taillight. And the cop says, uh, and the last one is three, three tickets now. I'm giving you a citation for not wearing a seatbelt. And he goes, now he gets, no, that's not right, officer. That's not right. I just unbuckled it when I saw you coming up to the car. And, and his, his wife says to him, Harry, you know what? You never wear a seatbelt. Just, just that's it. And the husband turns to her and says, Helen, Shut your damn trap and put a sock in it. And the officer turns to the wife and says, Excuse me, ma'am, does he always talk to you like that? And she says, Nah, only when he's drunk. <laughs> we like that here. Colonel Jeff and I both got a, a nice smile out of that. And uh, boy, there's still nothing like it's a great topic. 
good marriage jokes, you know, just, oh, you, oh, why did you have to, oh, oh, come on now. Well, this couple went through that that night. And uh, that's a good one. If you like it, pass it along. As always, it's like great old music. Don't just leave it on the shelf. Play it. Same thing with a good joke. And that brings me to my second favorite part of the show. The Poetry Corner. This is a, a, a good poem, a lovely poem, by the wonderful Emily Jane Bronte. And uh, that was a family, all oh, from England in the, uh, in the early part of the 19th century. She lived, by the way, from 1818 to 1848 and was the author of uh, Wuthering Heights, a great piece and made a wonderful movie, and the third eldest of all the Bronte's siblings. Let's see. In 1847 was when she published Wuthering Heights, and it had mixed reviews, as can happen, but later, of course, became a classic, which it really deserves. Like her sisters, by the way, all the the family became sick from the unsanitary conditions where they lived, which was because their water was being contaminated by the runoff from a church's graveyard. And, well, these things happen to them, and they happen to a lot of people. She died from tuberculosis. Charlotte, her sister, another great one, wow, wrote Jane Eyre and a book called The Professor and Shirley and one called Villette. But this is a nod and a smile to the great Emily Jane Bronte, and it's called Past, Present, and Future. Tell me, tell me, smiling child, what the past is like to thee. An autumn, evening soft and mild, with a wind that sighs mournfully. Tell me, what is the present hour? A green and flowery spray, where a young bird sits gathering its power to mount and fly away. And what is the future, happy one? A sea beneath a cloudless sun, a mighty, glorious, dazzling sea, stretching into infinity. Isn't that lovely? Well, the Colonel and I thought you'd like it, and I hope you did. There is, remember, like a good joke, there is nothing like a good poem, and I hope you like that one. And that brings me to my third favorite part of the show... M-M-M, the magic movie moment. This is a terrific movie, which my older son and I watched last night on uh, one of the internet channels that you can get. And I say that like I really know what I'm talking about, but I don't. He does. So you know what? Uh... We did. We watched this. It's a very good movie. In fact, it's terrific. The Cincinnati Kid from 1965, directed by Norman Jewison, starring, oh, what a cast this movie had. Steve McQueen, Edward G. Robinson, Carl Malden, Rip Torn, Anne Margaret, Tuesday Weld, Joan Blondell, Cab Calloway, Jack Weston. And by the way, it's worth noting The original director was Sam Peckinpah, the great Sam Peckinpah. But uh, after just uh, four or five days directing it, the studio and uh, the producer, Martin Ransahoff, said they decided they didn't like uh, what Sam was going to do with it. He wanted to make it black and white, and he wanted he was making it very, very rough and sort of low-grade, and uh, just a fierce and kind of dirty movie. And so they, well, they hired also the great Norman Jewison. And this movie became wonderful. Oh, boy. This is, uh, well, it's about poker players. And uh, Steve McQueen plays a young man, a young player from New Orleans. 
and he wants to take the title and be official from the man. That's his name. That's his nickname. The man. Lancey the Man Howard. And he's played by Edward G. Robinson. And, oh, boy, so they're going to have a big game in New Orleans in a hotel suite. And it's big, not small. And they all sit down, and boy, oh, boy, there's so many great moments. It's shot so well. And just to see Steve McQueen and Edward G. Robinson size each other up, it's really something. No one was ever better than Steve McQueen at taking what they call an actor's moment. He was very frequently in all the great work he did. He used to suggest, you know what, let's leave the line off this. He had a couple of lines, and he would suggest, let me just look at the guy instead. And he was right. Boy, there are so many. I remember one from The Sand Pebbles starring John Wayne, and he had to, his mate, his his below decks mechanic mate had been captured in China by the revolutionaries and they had they lashed him to a wheel and he was all tied there and they were going to show everyone still on the big boat only a hundred feet out at sea what they were going to do to him and it was a terrible a terrible torture they had in, in store and McQueen just grabs a rifle on board ship and he had a few lines, but he knew he'd have to kill his friend to save him from this torture. And with, that was one of the times that was best known. And I remember this scene. And he said, let's lose the lines on this and let me just do it. And he did. He picked up that rifle and just, folks, just his face, just his acting, just his body, as he looked at his friend a 100 feet away, about to be, well, tortured in agony. And his friend saw him, and he saw his friend, and he picked up that rifle, he laid it against his cheek, and fired one shot and killed him with one shot. And then his face afterwards, you know what, folks? He was right about a lot of things, but Steve McQueen was sure right about that. And watching him and Edward G. Robinson was also, good Lord, one of the greatest actors we've ever had. Watching him, Steve McQueen and Robinson, size each other up. And as the card game goes along, and as the drama comes in on the side stories, and whew, and by the way, and Margaret, oh, they're all so good. And Margaret, a great actress, and she, if there's anyone more beautiful or can really play this kind of she played a very bad girl she played carl malden's wife carl malden playing the character shooter and uh malden's great too and Anne margaret though boy oh boy you you know what you want to say she was so bad she was really mean and she was willing to do anything and then well wearing all those things that because she was so gorgeous that's another character of and a storyline of holy mackerel. But you know what? My magic movie moment for today. On a short break in the poker game, because those games are really something, as I'm sure you know. They last a day, two days, three days, day and night. And it's like pool playing. They just keep going until somebody says, that's it. I quit. I've had it. And on a short break in the hotel suite, they don't go back to their rooms. This is just going to be a 20-minute break. And, well, Steve and Edward G. walk over to the bar, and uh, they pour themselves a drink and start to chat just a little bit. And it's really something again. Ed, you know, Ed Robinson says to him, You ever been to Miami, kid? And every word out of his mouth is such a study. He's looking at him, just once again, that phrase I love, sizing him up. And McQueen, the same thing, looking back at him with that great McQueen look, sizing Robinson up. No, not yet. Haven't been there yet. You'd like it there. 
You could a uh, lot of action, a lot of a uh, lot of money, and uh, how about your your life there? Do you are you married? No, I'm not married. And they they start talking about this back and forth, but just to see them with that one drink, they poured themselves one kind of whiskey, and the other took another kind of whiskey, and just a sip or two from it, sizing each other up. And they've already played for a long while, but now. Well, it's going to come right down to it. And, folks, this is a terrific movie in so many ways. But just that point for a magic movie moment to see these two great actors really taking stock of each other and really just looking for a hold in there, not unlike when they're playing cards, just looking for something, just looking for a sign. And you know what? Whew. That's a magic movie moment for me. If you haven't seen it, see The Cincinnati Kid from 1965. If you have, if you've seen it, it's been a long time for me. But boy, I must have seen it, oh, a dozen, 15 times. And I really enjoyed seeing it last night with my son. And so we could both react with that. Whoa, whoa, good movie. And uh, I love Sam Peckinpah, but Norman Jewison was right. This movie was shot in color, and it was shot making these characters look interesting and letting them be themselves and showing Steve McQueen and Edward G. Robinson getting a feel for each other just by looking. It's really worth it, folks, and I hope you agree. Well, our younger son got sized up a bit this past week, a week or two ago, because where he's going, the University of Colorado, he's way, well, he's a great guy. I just love him. I love all my kids. And you know what? He had an art project that he made that was so good, it was chosen for a show at the university, at the museum, to be, to be shown, to be highlighted, picked to be hung. And you know what? That's really something. I uh, I don't I hope you feel the same way. We don't think about things. No, most people don't think about art that often. But you know what? He did it, and it was so good. They decided to hang it up, and it's hanging right now. And I can't wait to well, after the show here, and after the colonel, and maybe my son, and I go out for a bite. Maybe my wife, too. And I'm going to call uh, call my kid up there and say, how is it with your art? And I've already said to him, because it's the truth, he was always good at art. He was always terrific at it. And I said, draw more art. Draw, don't need to make it mechanical and with larger pieces that you fit together, and that's wonderful. But draw. Make Make drawings of people. You are always great at that. Use colors. Pick any way you like. You know, you can use pastels or you can use paint or anything. But don't let it slide. You're great at it. And, uh, well, you know what? Because that's, I think that's an important way to help raise your kids. And, uh, well, as I, as I said, you know, we're out back on the mainland here right now at Stately Miller Manor. And... Our older son, Sergeant Miller, is off somewhere after a good school day and decided to have, well, a quick nine holes. And uh, his mother, my wife, is off at a big show business meeting showing her stuff. And that's why, well, the colonel and the sergeant and I might just roll down the road for a bite after the show. And uh, But now, with those good feelings in mind, I have to be completely honest and tell you it's time for Hamper Update. That's right. Hamper Update. Oh, a Hamper Update. There's been no need. It's been a long time. But now there's a good reason. As many of you know, six years ago, I got us a new hamper. Now, I didn't tell my wife I was going to do that. And... You really need to tell your wife you're going to do that. It's not as dramatic as, say, getting new curtains. 
and not telling someone. But you know what? We needed a hamper. We'd been using wicker baskets before that hamper, one in our bathroom and one in each kid's room. And I just, you know, that's fine, but that's not easy. A wicker basket that sits on the floor. So you got to pick the basket up and carry it in to the pantry at the other end of the house. And I saw the new one I got, the one I got six years ago, I saw in a store and thought, you know what? Hey, that's a good looking hamper. And it was, whew, it was time to move on. And I saw the thing and it was big. It was bigger, the way bigger than a wicker basket. And I, plus it was a nice color. It was kind of a, kind of a, whoa, rose gray, pink, something or other. I don't know the names of colors real well, but I didn't care about that. I just thought, look at that thing just sitting there. And it wasn't bad. I think it was $29.95. And I thought, I'm just going to get it right now and put it in the back seat of the car and take it home and put it, put it right in our bathroom. And that can be a family hamper. So every kid gets to come in too and just toss things right in that. Well, you know what? I was right. Now, my uh, my wife wasn't crazy about it at, at first, you know, because while well, she hadn't been consulted, she ne- she deserves to know uh, all these things, and uh, and well, I, I, she th- she threatened to cut something off when I was sleeping, and you know, because of it, and I I don't think she would have done that, but but it was still probably a good idea. I I, I slept on the couch for not bad, just two or three years, and you know th- that. That, that's fine, but we all grew to like it. But then she, a week ago, saw an item, I think it was on Amazon or something, and they were hampers, and she got new ones. Not one, two, two new hampers, and they weren't official hampers. Well, they are, but they have wheels on them, and that's a big thing. The wheels are kind of big wheels. They're about five, six inches in diameter. And they were, they came and, you know, I had to put it together. Okay, she did. It wasn't me. All right, Frank, to be honest. But she put it together and with metal bars and metal hoops around the bottom and a big white cloth holder for all the dirty laundry. And the diameter of the top part of the hoop is about three feet three and a half feet, and folks, I'm telling you, she was right. These things are terrific, and I mean, they, they're they big, white, and round. We're going to show you some pictures. Colonel Jeff is going to take pictures of these and of the old fella, too, the one I got, and I'll tell you what, having wheels on it like that was a really good idea. Now, we all agreed that uh, it's not rectangular, it's circular, but just the way it's made and the way it looks and the uh, the white thing holding all the all the laundry, my wife and uh, my son and I all agreed just separately that it looks like something from a prison movie. You know, it looks like what the guy brings around to all the cells, and it's already got laundry in it, but they always put bottles of liquor that came in and all these things that. They just just slipped the prisoners through the bars. But folks, it's not often enough in marriage we get a chance to say this to, you know, someone. And uh, I said it to my wife. You know what? You were right. It was time to move on again. And you got two terrific hampers. And, well, as I already pointed out, we'll show show them to you. And... uh, I'm afraid, well, like Don Riley's hamper, I'm afraid I haven't told the old one, the one I got, I haven't told it yet. I think it knows something is afoot, though, because it's now he's not in the, in our bathroom anymore. He's in the hallway in the living room, just near the front door, too near the front door. And he knows he's just there. And a couple of Empty cartons are stacked next to him. So he already has a feeling that, 
Well, something is afoot. And, uh, but that's all right, too. Before I go out to dinner tonight with, well, Colonel Jeff and maybe my son, maybe my wife, I think it's time to take it down to where we have the other, well, the rest of the garbage and and put it out there. Maybe, you know what? Maybe a, look, maybe a couple of more days till next garbage pickup day. But his time is done, and I want to say a nice thank you to him. Not just to you. I'm saying that, you know, I want to, well, like with a doggy, you want to pet his head and say, buddy, I loved you since the day we met. And uh, in this case, I feel the same way about our hamper. My wife was right, but I'm glad I got that other fella when it was time to. I know that, and you know the things that I know. Homer is Homer, and Pluto is a planet. So remember, folks, as always, if you walked out of bed today and had a job to go to and a home to come back to and someone there who cares about you, folks, the game's over and you've won. So be well, get a new hamper for yourself too, and we'll see you here next time.